happy um, International Women's Day. And we think this is really appropriate for what we're going to do. We're going to have the structure of the, um, the session is going to be, we're going to have a um, 30 minute uh, discussion with our um, distinguished guests, which I'll introduce in a moment. And then we're going to have um, a response from a panel, which is um, myself, which is, uh, my name is Dr. Victoria Shawomni, and my colleague, which is Dr. Ponsu Morosso. I hope I've pronounced that right, but I'm sure she'll correct me when she introduces herself in a moment. Um, so that's uh, Ponsu. And then we'll go back to um, Cheryl. And then after that, we'll have open up for discussion. Um, we will be able to do um, some question and answers. So please do prepare your questions as the time goes on as well. And um, hopefully this will be a really successful uh, session. I know it will be anyway. So without further ado, because the time is of the essence, and I know it's early morning in, um, in America for Cheryl, so we're really delighted to actually have her with us. So I really want to say um, a very special thank you for um, Cheryl to have given up her time to be with us. And uh, she's a special um, person to us as well for Belmas, as she's got to know us, but also for WLE, which is the Women Lead in Education, and also very much where I first met her in AERA, which is American Education Research Association, which you more likely may touch on, depending on what she says in her talk. So um, it's uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Shaxhaft as a professor in the Department of Educational Leadership at Virginia Commonwealth University. She seamlessly uh, links this with International Women's Day, her being with us, as the lecture focuses on understanding the role of gender in leadership behavior and effectiveness, something that Cheryl has researched for almost five decades. In that time, the field has expanded in, to include creative, extensive, and wide-ranging research aimed at understanding the premise of gender in selection, support, and the effectiveness of educational leaderships. Cheryl's lecture aims to further examine the international range of this research, touching on where we've been and where we still need to go. Hopefully that gives you a little bit about what um, Cheryl will say to you. And I, and I have missed out some of her achievements. She's got a list of achievements, which I may come back to a little bit later to round off the, the um, session. But Cheryl, I'd like to introduce you now and welcome to Belmas. Thank you. Um, happy Wim International Women's Day. And thank you for this opportunity to talk about leadership and particularly the scholarship on women's leadership. Um, I started work on female leadership in the 1950s. I didn't know that's what I was doing then, but I'd begun as a girl to fight for fairness. That's the only word we had, fair. It wasn't fair. So my elementary school years in the 50s seemed like one long unsuccessful fight for equal access and equal treatment. Girls should get to be crossing guards. They shouldn't have to wear dresses if they don't want to. They should get to play sports, run track, take shop, mechanical drawing. We shouldn't get in more trouble for fighting back with boys when they bother us than the boys got in trouble. But I was 100% unsuccessful at all of these things that I fought against. Uh, I used petitions, I protested, I spoke up, um, I failed, but I didn't stop. Uh, so here I am uh, at age 72, a white woman from the US uh, who formally started studying women's leadership in, in 1974. So I'm only at my 47th anniversary. Belmas was already way underway when I started doing this. Uh, my approach, and I'm gonna use my experience a little bit uh, to sort of take us through where we've gone and where I think we're going in the area of gender and women's leadership. Um, but uh, my, my, my approach has been research on women, on gender um, for advocacy, for change. For transformation. And so personally, when I do work, I try to think, how could this be used? Uh, am I answering a question that is one that needs to be answered in order for us to move forward? Uh, and if so, how do I develop a, a research agenda and a study 
that can speak to that so that the next group of people can take it and use it and move us forward. So I'm basing a lot of what I'm talking about from that perspective. Also from uh, you know, a synthesis of research on gender over the past 50 years, and also on some new work that's coming out in, in the uh, Bloomsbury Handbook of Gender and Educational Leadership and Management, which is edited by our own Victoria Shinumi and Ponso Moroso and Ishar Apsala and me. So we started back then when I came into this research system with, um, with a question. Um, uh, how many women were there doing this work? How many women were there in leadership? Um, it was important to try to understand that. Um, not only does what gets counted serve as a measure of what we value, we can't know how far we've come or how far we have to go without documenting representation. Without those numbers, we're question, we have questions. And at that time we had questions like, how do you know women are, aren't represented in leadership tasks? Where's your evidence? So we wanted to know that. And many of us, and I'll speak for myself, were surprised to learn back in the 1970s that at least in the United States, those numbers weren't collected. Uh, not any of them. There was no reliable annual data to turn to. Uh, this was true, I found out, not only for the United States, but for other countries as well. Um, so here in the United States, we can tell you how many reindeer there are in Alaska, but we can't go online to a reliable source and tell you the number of school superintendents heading the 13,800 school districts in the United States who are women. So the lack of documentation of numbers by gender and by race, even when we started to get some gender numbers, they weren't broken down by race or ethnicity. So um, learning that women were minorities, were, were sort of a minority representation in school administration, once we got started, started to get those numbers, well, that helped a little bit. We could make the argument that women weren't represented. But we then also had to make the argument that when we talked about representation, we weren't talking about 50% women. We were talking about representation based upon where the job pool came from. Where did the people who became school leaders come from? In the United States, uh, women were 77% of the pool uh, from which leaders emerged, but depending upon the numbers you have, um, a smaller proportion. Right now, about 26% of school superintendents in the United States are female. Uh, people who would have come from that pool and moved up the line of 77% women. So that was the first thing, how many proportionality, and we're still working on that. We still do not have in the United States um, uh, an annual report of the superintendency broken down by gender and race. So that that's an issue. Uh, so the next thing we, we tried to think about was in terms of you know, making change, arguing, advocating, uh, moving forward was, was uh, why? Why weren't there women there? Well, the first pushback we got was, well, they just weren't interested. Women didn't wanna be school leaders. That wasn't something they wanted to do. So there's a whole strand of literature that continues to this day about whether or not women wanna be school leaders whether or not, uh, and if they do want to be school leaders, what kind of places do they want to lead and for what purposes? So we have that, um, that strand of leadership on transactional leadership, leadership that opens doors, leadership that nurtures and develops people, uh, and that that's the kind of leadership women would like to do by and large, uh, but that definitely, yes, women do want to be leaders. Um, so we've moved on, through that, we were asking those questions 50 years ago. We're still asking those questions and trying to get a clearer understanding of what those issues would be. Um, so the next set of questions that we started to answer and address in the literature is, okay, well, they wanna be there, then why aren't they? Why aren't women in these positions? Uh, this, this question, of course, has prompted studies across countries across continents uh, and is still going on. Why aren't women there? And if you look at those studies, you, you see studies on internal barriers, external barriers, 
Um, we see studies on strategies to get more women in. We see studies on, uh, on the kinds of things that need to happen, networking, support systems. Uh, but basically, um, all the studies kind of come down to that the masculinist, heteronormative, white culture of schools, male and white privilege, and all those assumptions surrounding male and white privilege um, are really the reason why women aren't there. It isn't that they don't want to be there. It's that there are barriers still, 2021, still regularly put up to keep women uh, out and to uh, particularly to keep women of color out. So documented uh, documentation of the kind of discrimination women face is still happening. And then we're especially looking now at discrimination and intersectionality. What, what, what are the issues that might be different for a white woman than for a woman of color? What might be the issues that are different for, woman, for women from certain religious backgrounds? What might be those differences? Sex, age, disabilities, civil partnership status. What are those issues? Um, we're also looking at the indirect discrimination issues like maternity rules, child leave rules. Uh, what, what, how do those keep women out or keep them from moving forward? Um, hostile workplaces. Uh, we're looking at harassment on the job that's still happening, uh, victimization, uh, what happens if you speak up and say this isn't fair, this isn't right, what happens to your career then, where are you going, what chances do you have. All these forms of discrimination are continuing. Fuller and Fuller and Barry have done some recent work in the handbook um, uh, about these different kinds of discrimination that are occurring now, uh, 2020, not back in just in, uh, in the 1970s where they were occurring, they're still occurring. So, um, so that's where that line of research has gone. It has a long history and it's helped. There's definitely the study of the barriers have helped to bring more women into school leadership, but speaking from the United States, it hasn't helped uh, enough we still aren't in positions of leadership in the proportions where we are in uh, the teaching and other staff. So another, another piece of the barrier was, well, maybe women just aren't good enough, okay? Maybe they just can't do the job. I mean, the job takes a certain kind of person. And what kind of person is that? Well, it's a, a man person, you know, a man, and that that attitude still exists, uh, still exists in 2021. But that that pushback, that response, that women really didn't belong in leaderships because they couldn't handle it, um, led to a lot of research that looked at differences between the leadership styles and the leadership outcomes of males and females. Um, that tried to to make some distinctions. Uh, uh, but particularly research that was done in the hope, I think, knowing the people who did it, in the hope that it would show that women, women did just as well as men. And so the notion that a woman couldn't do it uh, just, just didn't uh, explain why women weren't being hired. And so the findings in, in this literature is, are pretty clear. Either there are no differences or uh, in a lot of the early literature comparing women to men across the board, um, indicated women did a better job in school leadership. And you know, while I personally liked learning this and hearing this, I do have to admit that most of the early leadership didn't really compare apples to apples. There were differences in the abilities of the women who became teachers in our country and then went on to become school administrators and the men who became teachers and then went on to become school administrators. There were some, as a group, there were differences. The women tended to be more prepared, have more higher education, have before going into leadership, have more years in teaching, more experience in schools. They tended to have um, higher grades. Um, they tended to be smarter. Uh, they tended to have a lot more skills. And so we weren't really comparing the same group 
so it wasn't necessarily gender. It was a group that had that was filled with more able people compared to a group that was filled with fewer able people. Not that there weren't a lot of very able men in, in that group. So it's important to kind of understand some of those, those pieces. But that, that study of those gender differences uh, came out with a lot of people thinking different things. Uh, Lazadu talked about how women take care and men take charge and how there are some differences if you look at uh, male brains and female brains and, and what that means in terms of how they interact with people. There was a lot of research that looked at the notion of women as caretakers, women as paying more attention to, to people than to necessarily um, the tasks, the, the specific outcome task, but rather paid attention more to process, uh, to get to outcome as opposed to paying attention to the outcome and, 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 and not necessarily to the process to get there. But in studies of looking at leadership skills, women tended to have higher leadership skills, more leadership skills, uh, more credentials before being placed. Uh, actually, uh, Risha Berry and I just finished a study of uh, 7,400 school principals, and, the, and we were particularly looking at black women. Uh, and black women had higher credentials before placement as a principal than white women and then uh, white men and then and black men and so uh, again more credentials more experience more background um, we still however equate leadership characteristics as male characteristics ac across the continents we hear this a lot um, even though some of those male characteristics don't hold up to scrutiny you know uh, a lot of the ways we describe men are based upon our stereotypes our belief, but when you actually look at how men behave, uh, they don't necessarily themselves uh, live up to those quote unquote stereotypes. Uh, women have much higher expectations for themselves, but that's also a drawback. Uh, and this is still true. Women are less likely to put themselves up for jobs unless they're absolutely sure that they're totally prepared for it. Men are much more likely to take a chance. Uh, the, the plus for an organization is when the women get there, they're more likely to be able to hit the ground running. The minus is, is that we may lose a lot of women leaders because, um, because they're waiting to make sure that they're, they're completely and totally prepared. Um, we also find some differences about what a fulfilling career will be and what it should be and how they want to spend their lives in the job, in the school. Women tend to spend more time with people in the school, more time with kids, uh, more time interacting, uh, uh, more transparent and open communications uh, that have to do with things that they, that, that, that they personally like. And basically what happens when we get into a job is we tend to do the things that we're good at and the things we like, and then we delegate uh, the rest of it to other people. Uh, so if you think of it that way, um, we've always been delegating. Uh, no matter where the job is. It's just that women delegate different things in, according to the studies than men do. So this whole, this whole gender difference, male versus female, we're still studying these differences. Um, my question is for what purpose? Uh, and, and is gender really the, um, the, the important factor here? Why do we need to know if there are differences between men and women? I know why we needed to know it in the 1970s and the 1980s. Do we still have those same reasons? And so for me, thinking about doing research for action and transformation, uh, that's a question I have. The next set of research was, OK, it, once women get the jobs, what's it like? Uh, where are they? What do they do? And we have had progress across countries. We've seen more women move into leadership positions, but still not at the proportion uh, uh, as they are in teaching. So, and, and not even in equal proportions. Um, so some trends, it's still the case that the older the student, the more likely men are in charge. That's, we found that across, uh, across countries. Um, it's still the case that the more prestigious the school, the more men are in charge across countries. Um, the more precarious 
dangerous failing the school is, the more or the school district, the more likely women are in charge. Um, several studies uh, looked at, at where women are appointed and they're more likely to be appointed to difficult positions or placed into impossible leadership positions. Uh, uh, and compared to white women, minority ethnic women experience these ba uh, barriers more. Victoria's done that work. A lot of people have looked at, at those differences. Essentially, what we hear is that uh, if a school is really failing, if people have given up, there are two responses. One is, well, why don't we hire a woman? It can't hurt. You know, she can't do any worse than the other. Or, okay, it's gotten really bad. We need a woman to come in here and clean this up. But what the result is, is that women work in schools that, that present many, many more and higher and challenges than do men. Um, uh, we, women are in more likely to be in, still in acting positions, not the permanent position. A woman often gets hired into an acting position, but doesn't get hired for the permanent position. She's the placeholder. Uh, we still have pay gaps across, across countries, pay gaps between men and women, even in countries where equal pay uh, is, the, is the norm. There are ways that, um, that uh, women are paid less. And women still work in masculinist work cultures. Uh, cultures that protect a male career model, cultures that are easier to access and for men than for women, uh, cultures that uh, breed discrimination, uh, cultures that set up discriminatory practices that may not be conscious discriminatory practices, but that are there, the timing of meetings. Uh, look what's happened during COVID. Uh, it's the women teachers and the women administrators, particularly those with children, who have had the most uh, uh, difficult times balancing and doing, quote unquote, everything. Issues of maternity leave and childcare leave. These are just, these are still uh, uh, things that haven't been successfully addressed in most countries. So women are getting jobs. More women are getting jobs than used to get jobs but they're not necessarily getting the quote unquote best jobs. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, they are getting jobs where they can help the, the student who, students who have the most needs and who may need the most help and support. So I'm looking at where we are now and kind of trying to think about where, where, where is our research going? What are we, what in the last, five years, what, what have we as a field in terms of gender and leadership been working the most on? Um, one, of course, has to do with intersectionality and the, the multiple roles that we play and the multiple people we are. Um, and that there, there are many ways to be isolated and oppressed. Uh, oppressions work together in producing injustice. Uh, intersectionality is about these oppressions and, the, and about the frameworks uh, to be able to analyze the power relationships within organizations and how they, uh, how they determine what we can and can't do. Um, the work that we've done to disrupt this unidimensional understanding of organizations and leadership has been slow. Uh, first into the water, we stuck our gender toe, and then we took the other foot and stuck the race toe, but took the gender toe out. And then we took both feet out and put in the culture arm. And then we put, took everything out and put in the gender sexual identification arm. Uh, we need to just jump into the water and to try to pull all those pieces together. Uh, a full body swim to look at identity, cultural perspectives, gender, race, religion. How do all of those identifiers and identities uh, have an impact on how we lead and whether or not we're allowed to lead? Um, there's some concern that there's been a whitening of intersectionality uh, and that we need to pay attention to that uh, and that we need to keep our focus. Uh, on women of color, and I certainly agree with that. But, it, but in addition, I also think we need to look at the other ways in which people are oppressed and how those intersect with our gender, with our race. Um, 
we also need to understand how I think how LGBTQ plus identification uh, plays a role. Um, how does it play a role in a person's life? Uh, what do you have to do in terms of your own life and your own identity? What do you have to cover up, hide, not, not fulfill in order to get a leadership position? Uh, there isn't a lot of available research on this. There's some, uh, partly it could be because of the difficulty of studying this topic, but part of it could be that LGBTQ plus candidates, and there's some research that supports this, um, are really discouraged uh, for into entering leadership positions because they don't want the light shown on them in a way that would cause them to have to kind of shut down their personal life and their personal families. So these are important pieces of this idea about intersectionality. Another area that we're doing work on is the emotional work of oppression. What happens to people who are oppressed? What happens to people who are discriminated? What happens to their health? Uh, what uh, what, you know, what happens to their families, what happens, uh, what, what is, what are those health considerations? Uh, what are those uh, um, emotional considerations uh, that go on? Uh, and, and we haven't done a lot of work on that in terms of schools. Um, we're still working on the ideas of masculine and feminine. Are, are those dichotomies useful? Are they helpful? Uh, when we think about the, these things, I don't think we question enough how emotions and insecurity may guide leadership practices. Um, think about what it takes to give others credit, to take a back seat, to not be the center of glory. Um, these are emotional, psychological, and ethical traits. Oh, why are women more able to share the limelight than men? Um, why are women not as threatened by including others in the glory? Uh, are these just learned traits? Are these things we can change? Are men more insecure? Have women just been socialized to share and to downplay their own, their own parts in things? Is one sex greedier than the other? I mean, these are issues that have to do with styles of leadership and the issues about personal insecurity and leadership all too often invade uh, the workplace. Uh, uh, for those of you who've, who've had an insecure administrator, uh, you know how that works. Uh, so the other questions are, does a focus on the ethic of care become something else at some point? Uh, Wilkinson and McDonald talked about in Australia, the highly gendered notion of caring leadership. Uh, potentially positioning students and community as uh, endlessly grateful recipients of Anglo-centric middle-class female largest. You know, uh, is there some of that in there? Uh, where is the line between white female savior and a dedicated uh, educator? Uh, where is the line between helping and a deficit view of communities? And so looking at the the complexity of those choices and those ways of, of leading, which have often been associated with females. Another area that we're working on and that needs a lot of work is discriminatory complicit school cultures. You know, what I wanna say is work on the individual, interesting as it is, uh, or change for one individual isn't gonna help uh, change those school cultures. We need to do that individual work but we also need to look at how a school culture becomes discriminatory. How do we call it out? How do we make that change? Um, uh, uh, how, do we, how do we make organizations supportive of gender, supportive of race, supportive of, of all the students and all the staff? How do we make that happen? How do we do those transformations? We need to look at the fluidity of discrimination over time. How does discrimination work over time? Uh, we've, studies of women find that for a lot of women, uh, especially white women, especially white women, they come to consciousness about workplace discrimination during pregnancy or maternity. Up until then, they haven't thought about it much. They haven't thought that this might happen to them. 
but suddenly they discover discrimination when they have children, not only discrimination that has to do with their own children, but how they're discriminated against as a female and as a parent. Uh, and so looking at those kinds of issues would be important. Looking at black women's leadership skills and practices, uh, the community cultural wealth that Yoso talked about. Um, do we fail to recognize certain forms of capital? Uh, what parents see as best, what we see as best. Uh, those are often in conflict. Are there different kinds of capital? And have, have white people particularly failed to look at that? Um, very often we, we come to a place where we say that a notion of fixing inequalities by fixing disenfranchised communities rather than fixing what has disenfranchised them, rather than understanding that there's a lot of cultural wealth in those communities and we aren't tapping it. Um, I, I, uh, Portia Newman uh, is currently working on some really interesting research in that area looking at black women's uh, cultural wealth and how that's used and how that adds to this larger, I was gonna say toolbox, but I then I decided I should say sewing kit, but I'm, I can't decide uh, uh, what kind of language I want to use. But the idea that, um, that there's, uh, there are a lot of behaviors and skills that as cultures we have coded as deficits but they are actually cultural wealth and they inform leadership. They add aspirational, familial, social, navigational, resistant and linguistic capital to those people who have those skills. Um, looking at, at leadership models from mother, both the plus and minus, understanding expectations of women and the role of mothers, how that teaches leadership skills, but also how that uh, um, reproduces uh, oppression looking at the health consequences, as I said before, of masculinist uh, cultures and what that means. Robinson and McNay in their studies have looked at that. And then looking at motivation and aspiration. You know, uh, many women report they don't necessarily see leadership as associated with everyday practices and personal lives. They may do in tons of leadership, but they're not necessarily coding it as leadership. And looking at what is it that women aspire to be and are the organizations that women might lead, these educational organizations that women might, might lead, do they actually offer those opportunities for transformation of the organization for support? Um, uh, studies have found that women see promotion opportunities as an intensification of labor. What they see is that I'm gonna to have to work more and maybe work on things I don't care about. Men view promotion as leading to more opportunities to delegate and then have more freedom and autonomy to do what they want to do. So even understanding what, uh, what movement through and up the system means. So those are some of the things that I've thought about as I've gone back and looked at the last 50 years of research and where we are and where we're going. Um, I, I wanted to sort of do this overview uh, so that we could then have this conversation uh, uh, that um, amongst three of us and the group uh, to, to move forward. So I think I'm going to stop. Uh, I was going to talk about 30 minutes and I think I did. Uh, so I'm stopping. Thank you very much, Cheryl. That was really delightful. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure that um, the uh, our participants, our audience would also be um, really, really happy about that as well. Um, I, I just, I, there was a whole range of different things which um, you've mentioned, and I'm sure that uh, Ponsu and I have got some things we'd like to um, ask you um, about um, within the time we've got as well. But, uh, you know, I, I'd like to kick off if I may. Ponsu, please do come on, put your camera on so we can actually involve you in the com conversation as well. That's, that's really important. So I, I'm going to just um, take the advantage of, of saying a few things and, and uh, connecting with you, um, Cheryl, it's, it's really helpful. I mean, I like the bit when you, you, you mentioned earlier on in your, um, in your talk about the disrupting, uh, disrupting and um, interrupting what's gone on and, and the, full, the full body swim. I think that was 
fascinating and definitely that's definitely something which uh, I will take away from that as well but also thank you for mentioning our book the handbook on gender educational leadership and management I think that's really that was a really good shout out as well and I think that's really important but I've got a couple of um, questions I'd like to ask you if you if I may one is around data the data breakdown and I'd, I'd like to ask if I, if I can give you a couple of questions and then you can write them down and come back to us afterwards but um I'd like to ask, what do you say when um, higher education establishments or other organizations like schools do not want to reveal the data? And um, they, instead they say it's because um, there's not enough uh, women of color or enough women which are Asian, et cetera. And so they can't reveal it in the data. And it's instead, it becomes part of the hidden figure. So you don't actually get through with that figure. So that's the first thing I want to say. What do, what do you say to that? Because we, we come across that a lot in the UK about data and how we can't reveal it because it's going to show that there's a, they've only got two people which are actually of color in the whole university and they don't want to say that. So that's the first thing. The second thing about what you said as well, what you said about um, not being good enough as, as leaders, and is that one of the reasons why um, they haven't um, appointed more women? Okay, so if we accept that that's the case and that there are more women, which are white women, which are coming into um, leadership positions, if they say it's not about, one of the things which was saying that it wasn't about um, uh, that the women were not good enough. So what is it that they say um, what's the barrier then for black women? What is that barrier which for black women where they're not becoming leaders? What is it you think is the, the hidden thing within your, within your um, research? And, and the last thing I want to mention before, before I hand the um, baton back to you and then Ponsu will say what she wants to say is um, the pay gap. And I know that um, um, with Barack Obama, he mentioned quite a lot about the gender pay gap and we have a lot about the gender pay gap. But the, the, the discussion around that, we call it the ethnic pay gap, and then bringing black women into where they need to be on gender and, and race, um, we find that um, black women are paid at the bottom of the pay gap in the UK. So I just wanted those types of things to bring into the, the conversation. Now, I don't know whether you want to go back to that now or whether we want to bring uh, Ponsu into the conversation for her to say her bits. How would you like to play that, uh, Cheryl? You know, I, I'm ambivalent. I, I don't care. And any way we play it, I think will work. Okay. Uh, so, Fons, let's, let's bring you in. Right. Um, thank you, Victoria. And thank you very much, um, Cheryl, uh, for that um, talk. Um, it's not every day that um, you have um, somebody who's been studying the field for five decades in the room, in the virtual room. Uh, so this really is a privilege. Um, I've had this uh, privilege uh, working with you lately on the book and uh, it's, it's been great. Um, when I started my own PhD 20 years ago, um, yes, scary, 20 years ago, um, Cheryl Shakeshaft was the name um, um, and others, um, but, um, but, and so I could identify with um, um, many things that you were saying that I've seen in my two decades of research in this field. Um, uh, the the, the underrepresentation, which I, I insist is the question that um, gets us going all the time. It doesn't really matter from which angle you are studying this. What really uh, drives us uh, is the fact that um, there still aren't um, um, enough women representing um, um, other women in, in positions of leadership. So we could turn the question upside down. We could use different methodologies. We could um, 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 jump into the water. I like that too, Victoria. Uh, jump into the water and pull every uh, thing that we have. The primary question that is really driving us is that we don't um, have enough women representing women in positions of leadership. And so the question is, um, if one day we wake up and we have uh, these women um, representing us and we feel comfortable with that, are we going to stop? Um, uh, perhaps not. And, and one of the... Um, um, uh, issues I think uh, I have that um, I could just add maybe to, to what you said is um, 
my observation and I think um, the observation of uh, many other people in the field I see from people who have been feeding into the chat uh, it's colleagues of ours who um, have been in the field uh, for decades um, and, and so the, the observation is that it's us doing this work it's, it's women doing this work and about women uh, so when we talk about uh, the dichotomy um, of, of looking at gender as um, a dichotomized concept um, and looking at uh, femininity and masculinity um, and looking at differences between men and women and that's how we've been um, studying the field but then the question becomes how do we how do we move beyond that how do we move beyond that and and get um, other people involved? How do we get a man involved uh, in this research? And um, uh, we probably um, um, have an assumption or we do know from some studies that would suggest that um, if um, this was a man's problem, something would have been done about it um, some, some time back. So how do, we, how do we bring that lot um, on board and, and, and just um, maybe uh, get to, to hear them? And the, the final uh, thing that I'll say is that um, and I think this probably happens with uh, many of my colleagues as well, that um, our students come because maybe they will see your work um, and now they probably will come, they, they will see, they see your work, they see my work, they see the work of other people that I know that I've um, written, co-written with, and they want to study um, uh, the whole notion of women in leadership, but they feel like, the questions have been there forever. And this is what you also say in your talk, Cheryl, that we're still asking the same questions that um, you were asking when you started 50, um, 50 years or 47 years ago. And, um, and so the question is, how do we get motivated to do this work? Because I have also observed that our colleagues would come on board, do a couple of studies on uh, women in leadership, and then uh, venture off and do something else and then come back after some years, the questions are still there. Um, so maybe um, in your wisdom, having been in the field uh, longer than uh, most of us, um, what, what would you say um, uh, we, we draw the motivation? Where did you get the motivation to be going in this field for, for 47 years? So I think I'll end it there because I think that there'll be more people wanting to ask more questions. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll start backwards. Um, I get my motivation from my students uh, for t a number of reasons. First, I see these really capable people who aren't getting jobs that they deserve. And I see really capable people doing really interesting work. My students have done over the years incredibly interesting work around these issues. And almost all of it focused on expanding our knowledge but expanding in ways that people could use this knowledge to fight for more equal representation, to fight for laws uh, that would help us. Um, and so um, uh, did I think that nearly 50 years later when I started this work, uh, we would still be dealing with these issues? No, I, I didn't. Uh, I actually didn't but we are, uh, and, uh, and so it gets, and somebody I think has written in the chat something about that, Joan Woodhouse, I think the, the, the notion about it's the individual can't do it. We have to disrupt the structures and the hierarchies and the ways organizations are ordered and made. Uh, otherwise, uh, th there's no way to do this. We, have, we, need, we need different ways of interacting in organizations that aren't so hierarchical. Uh, and that's, and that's, a, that's a big thing. Uh, and, a, and, and if I knew the answer of how to do that, uh, you know, we'd be, if any of us knew the specific answer of how to do that, we'd be a lot farther along. But one way we know how to do that is uh, as a group. So having groups that get behind it, having Belmas, having the uh, women leading in education across continents, having unions, having groups to support the deconstruction of these hierarchical organizations into organizations in which more people have more power at more levels would be very, would, is something I think we need to spend more time on. Uh, and uh, because that will, 
healthy individual. Um, we said if this is a man's problem, it would probably be solved only if it's a white man's problem. Um, so uh, I, I would, uh, white men's problems get solved all the time. You know how many ads there are to help bald men? Um, so uh, uh, so the, the, the issues I think are, are how do we get, at least for me to think about, how do we get legislators how do we get laws? How do we get organizations to change their policies and their rules? Because the, these formal laws, policies, rules, regulations have contained us in ways that make it hard to organize to change. So how do we change childcare issues? How do we change maternity? How do we change uh, the notion of what a workday is and what a workplace is? I don't know about you, but I used to, I at once thought if I became a professor, what we'd do is I'd do some research, we'd sit around and talk to each other, we'd have these wonderful, glorious conversations. Um, uh, uh, I don't know, we'd take walks in the woods, who knows? Being, being a university professor, nobody really looks at the nature of the work. The nature of my work is I work seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. That's what I do. Uh, in order to do all the teaching to the level that I think it should be done, all the work. Um, so what we've done is we've made, we've made institutions and work in institutions um, untenable in many ways. And we aren't looking at the nature of the work. I look at, at teachers and how much time they have to spend in schools and then after school and at nights and on weekends. Uh, to, to be able to do the work that's there to be done. Uh, and the teachers I know, whether they're in universities or in K through 12 schools, and the leaders I know uh, aren't ones who say, well, if it gets done during a nine to five, it's done, otherwise too bad. There are people who say, I'll keep working and I'll keep on it. So this goes back to the structural issues of institutions. We don't hire enough people. We don't spend enough money to support them. We don't have enough support services. Technology has been great in one way, but in another way, it's just added to the work I do. Uh, because downloading, filing, uploading, making my own address lists, you know. So, so we don't look at the nature of our tasks and our work and how oppressive that can be in these organizations. Who does what work? Um, when we talk about data, I would say that, yes, I understand the issue that if there are sensitive questions, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in a school where you're saying um, how many people pass the state tests, if you only have one uh, child of color, you don't want to uh, break everything down by race because you don't want to identify that one child of color. But that, that shouldn't be a blanket uh, reason for not releasing data. If there are only two Asian women or two in the whole structure and the whole staff and faculty at certain levels, we should know that. We should absolutely know that. Um, we can't make changes without knowing that. So I think we have to look at what's behind the reason for not releasing the data. If it's to protect someone because knowing that would harm them, that's one reason. If it's to shine the light on practices that have limited people, that's another reason. Um, so so I, think we have to, I think we have to challenge that and, 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 and kind of, um, you know, look, look at the reason behind and the intent and whether or not it really harms. The issue of not being good enough and for black women, um, I, 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 I think that uh, in every area that I've studied where there are any discriminatory practices, where there's any less pay, where there's any of any of those things that would be negatives, black women are at the bottom. Uh, so there's a hierarchy. Um, and, and what we found in our study of the 7,400 school principals is that white women are more like black women and black men, but 
than, than they are white men, but still a long way different than black women and black men. And amongst black women and black men, black men have, for instance, schools that are less dangerous. Um, they have salaries that are higher. They have more opportunities. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's a hierarchy there as well. And so that's why I think, you know, looking at data from those intersectionalities uh, would be really useful. And I, I think of Kay Fuller's work where people who have multiple intersectionalities, they know that, that it's multiple things uh, that explain what's happening to them. It's not just one thing and trying to understand um, what that means. Um, I think that's really helpful, Cheryl. Um, can I open up to um, the questions to the audience now, if that's okay? Yep, so I've, we've got some questions here. Now, between myself and Ponsa, we're going to try and manage the, um, the, the, the different questions which are coming out. So um, what we'll do, uh, Cheryl, so um, we'll manage that and pass them on to you. And if we do them in, if we get enough of about three at a time, we'll give you three at a time, and then we'll move on to the next ones when you feel, and just look up when you think you're, you're ready to kind of pass on. So we've got, um, Ponsa, do you want to do, there's a couple there on the chat. There's one for Ian, I think, which has mentioned one. Yeah, uh, there's there's one for Ian, um, and there's a, an earlier one from uh, Joan Woodhouse. I don't know if um, it was just a comment, but I think um, it, it's it's a comment that could uh, be responded to because um, the point she's making is maybe we need to be asking different questions, um, and 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 so and and she just <laughs> probably a question as well, yeah, um, and so maybe um, that's something that could be responded to, and and the question for from um, Ian, um, uh, it's about how can the society, how can Belmas disrupt things? And I think um, I think Ian and, and, and um, members in the audience would really love to hear um, Cheryl's response to that. And we've got one other one as well. Yeah. We've got the Q&A, which is from Jim Perkins. Um, he wants to know about, does the research give statistics on percentage of those women who successfully turn around those systems. So that's another one as well. So we'll, we'll give you those three and then we can um, go on to the next one. Thanks, Cheryl. Well, let me start from, from the notion of do, do women turn around the systems? Yes, there are some, not necessarily the statistics, but there are a number of studies about women who actually have turned around systems and being successful at doing that, but also the price they had to pay to do that and the resistance they had to meet to do that. So they made inroads, but not without sacrifice to, of themselves and of, of, their, uh, of their health and of their energies. Um, uh, Carrie Robinson did a study of uh, women superintendents and looked at superintendents who'd been success who had retired and why they retired. Uh, and many of them had fought the good battle and made the changes and everything, but the personal price was finally more than they could deal with. The behind the scenes discrimination, uh, hostility, toxicity uh, moved them out. Uh, and we don't see that because people keep quiet about it. We keep quiet about toxic organizations. We just say, maybe I'll go someplace else and it would be better rather than really calling out the toxicity. Um, I, I, I don't know how Belmont can disrupt. Uh, I, I think that organizations can disrupt though by changing the focus of the kind of research that we encourage by, uh, by providing a lot of uh, support for, for learning about our own uh, biases by supporting things like um, equity audits to have institutions do equity audits of their practices, their policies, their outcomes, so that we can look at our own institution and say, um, gee, you know, I thought we were pretty good, but look here, these kids as a group uh, aren't getting the same kinds of supports as these kids. And the, we've seen more, more black women leave the jobs than other people. Why is that? And so 
equity audits and, and a, an organization that supports that for organizations, including universities, I think really help because most of the time, this goes to implicit bias. Uh, so we learn about our own implicit bias. We learn how to respond to it, but organizations have implicit bias. And so equity audits help organizations identify where this implicit bias may be showing up in terms of who gets employed, who leaves, who stays, uh, what services go to what people. Um, we keep our salaries hidden. You know, we don't let people know what we earn. Uh, and, um, and I think, that's, I think that's, that's, that's not good. In the United States, if it's, a, if it's a higher ed institution, that's a public institution in some states, that information is available, not in all states. Uh, I think it's important uh, to talk about what we earn and, and how we are, are compensated. Uh, we don't know that. Um, so organizations that help us do that, it seems to me um, could be very, uh, 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 it could be very useful. Um, and, then, and then really, how do we pro provide supports for people in these toxic organizations? What tends to happen is, in my experience, is we don't want to be close to the person who's been, who's being targeted in a way. Part of us wants to pull back because we're afraid it's catching. We're afraid we'll get it. We'll next be the next person to be targeted. Um, so that person doesn't get the support and aid that they need. We're afraid to come out and just say, we support you, or this isn't right. Or, um, and so uh, silent things happen. People leave our faculties uh, and we know that they've been driven out and we don't speak up or we don't say that's wrong. We can't have this happening. So more of us speaking up and providing the individual, not just private support. We often do it privately, but we don't do it publicly. So they don't get that public affirmation and support um, in institutions where in higher ed institutions, um, uh, students have no idea uh, that somebody they think is the best professor they ever had is being driven out of the, of the institution. Uh, students should have a say in that. Uh, and our, our, it goes back to institutions don't want certain things to come out. They don't want certain things to come out because, uh, because if they do come out, uh, we can legitimately say you were wrong you did the wrong thing. This isn't right. You have to change this. You have to work on this. So whether it's not reporting the percentage of employees by uh, race and gender, or whether it's not calling out acts that are driving people from our, from our faculties and from our schools, we have to speak up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. That's really helpful. I'm going to move back to Ponsu. She's going to do the chat. I think she's got a couple of questions there. And then I'll go back to the Q&A. Over to you my friend yeah um it's, it's actually difficult to manage the chat because it's full of comments and questions yes. um, but i think there's a a question from from janet janet harvey my former colleague um and she's asking what research is there about women leaders who support the patriarchal structures mm, that's interesting okay um and there's another one i think if i can pull three um, from Margaret Turnbull, who asks, um, how can we get women to empower women to recognize their skills instead of deferring? And there's a statement there that uh, supports that question, but I think that's essentially her question. And then um, I think the last one uh, that I can pull out from this side of things is from um, Mary Kunin. Um, Mary is asking, uh, when we talk about when we talk about we can do, I'm sorry, Mary, um, let, me, let me run to the question. Uh, do we need a perspective um, and input of those that uh, do belong, um, which is the main, or uh, if so, how that is a shift? Cheryl, please just um, um, answer what you thought you got from that. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure whether Mary was writing this as a question or just as a comment, um, but those, those were the, the two uh, and three uh, that I pulled out. There's and more, if, there's yeah. more. I'm worried that time is running out. Yeah, and if Mary wanted to uh, unmute and if we've misrepresented her, she can always unmute. Okay, um, Cheryl, we've got, if you can give three minutes on those ones and then I'm gonna give you some more. 
we've got so we've got a bit we're okay for time right so i think every time you can nominate a woman for something nominate her every time you can give her an award give it to her it's important (laughs) i I know it sounds silly but it's really important uh women won't nominate themselves so we, we had to do it spend uh five minutes a day uh, sending affirmations to people. I try to, to every day send something to somebody who's doing something good just, uh, just to reinforce that somebody out there sees the good you do. And these are almost always women I send these to because um, they don't hear it enough. They don't hear that enough. Um, so uh, women, yes, we, ha- we have women who support the patriarchal structure. Um, I ignore them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> meaning that I have only so much energy and I'm not going to fight with another woman. Um, uh, so, uh, so that's what I do. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm just saying that, that I'm going to take my fights where, where I can. And, and I, and I, I, I don't feel like tearing down another woman, even though she needs to be torn down. It's just not the work I want to do. Um, uh, and someone said it's hard to ignore the woman if she's your boss. Um, I can speak to that personally. Yes, I understand that. Uh, but and you stand up to the women. Okay, I'm not saying you ignore them with that and don't push back. Yes, you push back. But uh, so often um, I find myself being uh, people trying to persuade me to move against in a movement against a particular woman uh, for whatever reasons and. And that may be, it may need to happen. It's just not something that I'm going to do. Uh, either I'll go to the woman directly and say what I have to say, uh, but where my energies go, maybe some other place. Um, I just think women don't get enough support. There are some who may never appreciate the support they get. Um, and uh, following the patriarchal rules has been successful for some women. However, uh, there have been studies about those patriarchal women followers. And it turns out that they tend to come to a bad end, uh, all on their own. Uh, and so uh, they they think the patriarchy is going to support them. They think they'll be okay. They think they'll be uh, 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 moved along and protected. But in the end, just like other women, they aren't. Uh, if they step out of line, if they step away from from the uh, you know from the script, they aren't protected. They're thrown aside. Um, I think that's really interesting actually Cheryl what you've just mentioned because we could say the same thing and I'm speaking for myself um, I I haven't discussed this with um, Ponsu at all so this is me speaking I think we also have the same um, discussion um, around black women as well there was there are some women which look like us who who want to keep things as they are because they feel that they're benefiting from it and so somebody who perhaps comes across as a little bit too loud or a little bit kind of outside the 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 kind of concept which they feel they've survived or they've progressed in and then somebody else comes along which is black and a black woman which puts it all into jeopardy they also want to keep their head down and think no 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 we 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 can't we can't um support that person so uh when you're talking about women and you're talking about the patriarchal and some women want to keep that yeah we have that same discussion with black women but people don't want to talk about it it's it's more likely a hidden gem now i'm very much i don't want to take up the the time so i'm going to move on to some more questions if i may um uh, Cheryl, I know we're moving you along a little bit, but I just wanted to put that out. We've still got a little bit of time left, so that's really good. So we've got um, three people here. One's from Mary, Mary Bridget Burns, who says, you know, hello, friends. Um, how are we preparing teachers in training to advocate for themselves? Are we doing that formally or through informal networks? She wants to know about teaching. Then I've got Kerry here, Jordan D- Doss, who's talking about, about intersectionality. And is it important to understand the complexity of lived lives? Should our research focus on our stories at individual level to challenge homogenizing narratives? That's that's a that's an interesting one as well. And the final one is Tomika Ferguson. Um, with the change that has occurred, how much research influence the policies to move the needle forward? Are there lessons we can take from the policies? that have changed that we can continue forward. So there's three key questions there, if you don't mind, and then we go on to Ponsu afterwards. So I think we'll have time for three more questions. Thanks, Cheryl. So 
I would say about preparing teachers, I don't think we do enough to prepare teachers, at least in my understanding. And you all have your are in your own institution, so you know, but I don't think we've actually even looked into this enough. How do we prepare teachers to be active uh, participants in an organization, to speak up, uh, to be able to understand the politics of an organization? Um, and we don't. And I think that's, that's, a, that's an important issue. I think we also don't uh, prepare teachers necessarily uh, about the ways in which they may uh, be the targets uh, of discrimination on any number of their of their personal characteristics and what to do about it. So that area definitely, I believe, needs some work. Um, yes, I think it's important to study the lived lives and hear the stories of people. Um, uh, that's how we understand really the complexity of everything that's going on. So I, I hope people keep doing that work because it's such important work uh, to be able to understand uh, that. Um, I, I, I think that for policy, for po my, my experience in terms of policy change is, is that it's really three things. It's, it's being able to get in touch with the right person uh, in who, who either makes the policy, who makes the decision about the policy uh, or, uh, or the law. And it's providing them with two kinds of data. One is numbers, people use numbers. Numbers convince people. But stories then take you from, that sounds like a good idea to, um, to yes, let's do this. So it's my experience that you have to combine two kinds of, of information in terms of for policy making. The, the stories of people are persuasive. And then, and then legislators and others who make rules or policies uh, then fall back on the numbers uh, as a secondary support. So it's those two kinds of data I think are important. But first you have to figure out who's, who are the people who who we need to talk to. And that's often the hardest for many of us because we don't know who they are. We're not in that world. We don't have those links in that world. And so building up those links, and that's where I think an organization like Belmos could do a lot of, uh, uh, could be very helpful. Certainly in my country, such organizations can be very helpful. Uh, AASA in the US is wonderfully helpful in linking policymakers, researchers, practitioners, uh, those three uh, areas uh, to try to, to have changes happen. Thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. I'm going to pass you on to Ponsu now. Um, and then uh, Cheryl, Cheryl mentioned AASA, and uh, there's a, a lovely comment from um, Sharon Adams-Taylor uh, uh, sending her love. Um, and that's um, no more questions on the chat side, but uh, there's an earlier question on the Q&A from Jim Perkins. Um, and Jim Perkins is asking, uh, Dr. Shakeshaft, you mentioned women. Actually, he makes an important uh, point earlier. Great point about uh, not enough women in authoritative positions looking out for other women. I've seen the same um, said about black men. And then the question is, um, you mentioned women usually inherit schools or systems that are in trouble. Does the research give statistics on the percentage um, of those women who successfully turn around those systems. Do you want, do you want to take another one on the chat? Because there's loads and I'll do some more afterwards if possible. I'm oh, not the chat, the Q&A, sorry. Oh, Q&A now. I, I jumped to Jim um, because I noticed we skipped it. Um, right. Oh, well, I, I was just going to say, I, I don't have the specific, I don't have the statistics on the number of women who've turned around. But there are there is research out there on women who have turned around uh, and have been successful, and 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 some of that research does point out the um, uh, the price they paid to do that, the personal price they paid to do that. Right, um, and uh, Tamika Ferguson, you asked that one, Victoria, right? Yes. Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, yes, I have. It's um, I haven't asked Nag Nagris, Ara, or Imola. What will the suggestions? B, to overcome gender discriminations in your research. So what are the suggestions to overcome gender discrimination? And um, Emiola is asking, um, in your experience, 
what are some things that women can do to support other women to climb the leadership ladder? Hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, um, I had a shout out to Emiola who's doing really good research. Uh, I just want to point out. And she's looking at, at social capital and, and, and girls and what this means as well as some other studies she's doing. But she points out there's not enough emphasis on, the, there's so much emphasis on the person and not the act or the practice of being a leader. Uh, and, and I think that's important because we have, we have, when we talk about the practice of doing leadership, we're, we often are really talking about the practice of doing management uh, in, in our courses, in our training. And that's different than doing leadership. And what I find is that women, while they're fine at doing the management, they want to do the leadership. And so the questions are leadership for what? What are you leading for? Can we have those conversations? And how do you lead that way? And the studies of women say that they tend to be leading for social justice. Uh, that's what they're looking at. They may not call it that. They may call it equality. They may call it opportunities. They may call it whatever. But there's a lot more talk about leadership amongst women than there is in the study that the studies show and more talk about management among men about the tasks we do. So yes, we have to know all those management tasks, but if we're talking about leadership, then we have to talk about values and we have to talk about what we wanna see changed and how we're gonna do that and strategies for that. And I used to think in our leadership classes, you know, we should be teaching leadership about community organizing. You know, there's a whole curriculum about how to do community organizing and, you know, ask Barack Obama. Um, and, and, you know, we don't teach that in our in our leadership courses, uh, 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 you know. Uh, and so there's there's all kinds of things we, we could think about if we thought about what are the skills we need for leadership, for organizing people to move forward and make change. Those are often different than the skills we teach in our courses or our workshops or whatever that have to do with management. I think that's a really good point you've made there, um, Shell, especially, I mean, that's something which I've started to do in Brazil. I haven't been in Brazil of course, since the last year, but around community feminist leadership and, and, and what's going on there, which again, we don't really see much of what's happening around that, but um, leadership within the community and communities which perhaps are not as um, uh, looked at as, as perhaps um, some uh, feminist groups. I think there's a final one here, which we'd, I'd just like to ask before we um, uh, close the uh, discussion is on Nadell uh, Simon. I wondered whether you could just, I think you were browsing at it and whether you could actually look at the, the question at the end of what she said, which is about a research on international school leadership in different contexts, which is the UK and the Middle East. And it showed the top position in these schools are for men. Women were predominantly second in line or deputies and vice principals. It seems that this gender discrimination is widely accepted and not problematized in multiple communities. How can we as researchers carry this conversation into different contexts at different levels beyond academia and research groups? And I think that's a really powerful uh, question to leave you with, if you can uh, say a few words about that, please, Cheryl. I try to think of ways, I try to think of some ways that we can do some of these things. Some, some are, are using accrediting agencies that, that, actually, that actually do these gender audits and race audits and, and equity audits for, for organizations to be able to have a scorecard. This, this school, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, another thing is to, is to try to point out that the school has a responsibility uh, to show women in strong leadership positions, not only to inspire girls, but also to help boys understand that the world is not just male dominated and male centric. So we, we have some responsibilities there. So I always have this vision of having this, this, this you know, uh, this site where anybody can go and look up their school and their organization and, and see, see their score, <laughs> see, see where they're strong, where they're weak in terms of, of these, these equity issues. Uh, a, a place where, where you, could, you, could at, you could get the answers to your questions. If I send my child to that school, what am I gonna see? Uh, if my child goes to that school, what's happening? So, I, so I, I'm trying to think of more public ways to, uh, to take the 
pull the curtain aside as well as, as regulatory ways to pull the curtain aside. Thank yeah. you, Shell. There's a final one there um, from um, Amy Ola again, um, which I think is interesting because Victoria and I have just um, contributed a chapter uh, talking about um, uh, women as it. So maybe Victoria can respond to that one. Um, and, and Amy Ola says, you talked about women not seeing themselves as leaders. Could this be because so much emphasis is on the person and not the act or practice being a leader versus doing leadership? Yeah, I, I think so. That's a, that's a good insight. And again, uh, when I see people doing stuff, uh, and for instance, my colleague Tamika Ferguson, she was doing things recently, and I sent her a little note. You are, this is fantastic leadership you're doing. You are a leader, and she is, I'm telling you, she is fantastic. And so the idea is, you are a leader. We need to, re we need to remind people that the things they're doing, that's leadership. You are doing leadership. That's what it is. That's what leadership looks like. And again, I think we often, women do a lot of leadership, uh, but I'm not sure they get the, that, that anybody reinforces that that's what it is. So we reinforce it by saying, oh, you're so kind. You're so caring. That's true too. That's all true. But it's leadership that you're doing as well. And I think we need to name it more. The more we name it, the more women are able to then say, that's right. I am a leader. That's right. That's what I'm doing. I'm a leader. Yeah, yeah absolutely. How, how we phrase it, how we phrase the practice of leadership, um, um, I would add, and, um, and that um, uh, women bring themselves into this. Um, so it's about the person, yes, and it's also about the act. So uh, and that interaction between the person and the act is what make, uh, makes the practice of leadership. Um, I don't know if there's one more. I, I want to just add something to what I said. When people speak up in an organization and say something that maybe some people don't want to hear, I think the first thing we need, we should say is thank you for your leadership. Instead of, because when you do that, you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm making a fuss, I'm doing this, you know, I, I'm causing problems, I'm making people uncomfortable, whatever. And, and so we just need to keep reaffirming that, that that act is a leadership act. Thank you for your leadership. Okay. Is that it, Victoria? It is indeed. I just want to say thank you so much, Cheryl. I really want to give you a virtual hug <laughs> and say thank you. Ponsu, thank you so much for being by my side. And we together have been able to, I hope you feel the same, um, work with Cheryl. Um, it's, been, it's been a delight. It really has. International Women's Day. Um, it's really kind of put a little smile on the, on the table for us. Ponsu, do you want to say something before I move on to the last thing? Yeah, um, uh, just to say that um, um, all the work, um, and I, I know that there's um, people had more questions than they we were able to field and answer, uh, but that um, um, some of the work that um, uh, Cheryl was speaking to um, will be there in the uh, book. Um, it's a handbook uh, uh, that uh, we are currently working on. It will be out uh, for 2022. Um, and also another a piece of um, uh, important um, collection is the special issue that we did for the women leading education um, uh, conference we had in Nottingham, um, it's not last year, it's 2019. Um, but that almost all that work is out there now. And I, I just wanted to point people to some of the recent um, uh, research that uh, people have been doing in this um, work people who've been finding motivation uh, to keep going um, um, and asking questions in different ways, asking questions in the same ways, but um, are finding uh, ways to contribute to this work. And, and really just to reiterate um, Victoria's thanks um, uh, to Cheryl, that this has been um, a wonderful event and we really are grateful that uh, Cheryl was able to spend um, uh, International uh, Women's Day with us um, at Belmas uh, celebrating its 50th uh, birthday um, and 50th 
anniversary. Um, and, anniversary. And, yeah, anniversary. And um, just to uh, thank um, the the office, Richard. Uh, Richard is there behind that 50 years sign. Um, Richard, thank you very much uh, for putting uh, this together for us and uh, for being there. We knew that um, if things were to go wrong, you'd be behind us. And Kay Fuller has very kindly um, pasted the link to the Frontiers and uh, Special Issue. So if um, some of you would want to check it out now. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you. And if any of you are, are not members but would love to be members for the 50th anniversary uh, um, as part of Belmas, please do get in contact with our office manager, which is um, Richard Davis, who would be delighted to send you the information on membership. And, and finally, um, because this is a, a anniversary year, we've got um, some more events coming up. They're gonna be coming up every single month anyway, but we have one on the 17th of um, March, which is the CEPALS, C-E-P-A-L-S Riggs, and that's going to be on the 17th of March. And then in April, we're going to have the governance uh, rig, which is on the 22nd of April. So please continue to watch this space. There is lots of things happening and this will continue until the end of the year. But like I said to you, if you haven't become a member, do become a member. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheryl, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Ponsu and um, Richard, thank you again and his team and look forward to seeing you soon.